But the main horror was inflicted upon Louis Riel, and that was his trial. Uh, there were 30 some other trials, but Riel's trial was special because Johnny McDonald was sure he wasn't going to let that bugger live. All of, he'll hang them, all the dogs in Quebec howl in his favor. That was his, his opinion of Johnny McDonald, uh, Louis Riel. So when Riel's trial, and Riel's trial is the Canada's most um, significant state trial. I mean, we haven't had many state trials, but that was one. And it was manipulated to the nth degree. So the trial, sh was the trial should have occurred under a Queen's Bench Court in Manitoba. That was a legitimate court to hold a trial. Instead, Louis Riel was dropped off in Regina and put up before a magistrate, a stipendary magistrate. That's somebody who gets paid to be a, a judge uh, dealing with issues such as uh, you know, broken windows. A magistrate, you know, it's the lowest court there is. And Louis Riel is charged with high treason, the highest count, the highest criminal charge available. There wasn't even that charge before he was put on trial. They had to go to England to find a law, and the law was written in 1371, the law of high treason, wherefore thou did this, uh, destroy the sovereignty of Her Majesty the Queen, and did cause rebellion, something to that effect. So this ancient law was dragged into Saskatchewan, Louis Riel was dragged up to court, and there he was facing a stipendary magistrate who just happened to be a close friend of John A. McDonald's. And his lawyers, who he had never met, he, there was a defense committee established in Quebec to provide Riel with lawyers because Louis Riel never ever had any money. He never had any personal belongings or anything along those lines. He I was always giving it away or whatever. So the People of uh, Quebec, or not so much the people, but people in the know established a defense committee and hired two lawyers, uh, Fitzpatrick and Lemieux. And these lawyers came out to see Riel and uh, defend him. Well, they visited him once, about four days before the trial. And then they left and really didn't come back. He's going, where are you guys? I want to talk about how we're going to defend me. We're going to defend the actions. We're going to prove the government was wrong in their dealings, that they were uh, just not, not giving the people any of the advantages that belonged to a citizen. This was both the Métis, uh, the settlers who had great problems, and the Indians were starving on their reserves. So Louis Riel had come back from Montana to serve these interests, and now he was charged with high treason. His lawyers visited him at once, came out, and they sent a telegram to the leader of the defense committee, who just happened to be Riel's bishop, Bishop Taché. And he says, yes, we agree. He's insane. They paid no attention to Riel's evidence. They never attempted to get his papers. They never attempted to get the witnesses he wanted. He wanted to have people who could tell what had really happened. So the trial comes along, and it is such a travesty that he has no opportunity to defend himself. When he stops the trial, he said he can't stand it anymore. His lawyers are going on and on about being insane. And he stops trial and he says to the judge, can I fire these guys? Can I defend myself? Can I question witnesses? Can I cross-examine? And the judge says, oh, no, you can't be doing any of that. And his own lawyers jump up and say, tell the prisoner he can't talk. He cannot disrupt our defense of him. Riel was shut down. He wasn't allowed to speak during his trial. He wasn't allowed to... Talk, his lawyers li wouldn't listen to him. He'd say, ask him these questions. And they wouldn't know what he was talking about. Or they ignored him. So the trial is going on. It's on about the fourth day. 
Riel has not been able to say a word in his own defense. They wrap it, and the jury of six, now interesting enough, a jury under the laws of uh, Britain and the Magna Carta should be 12 peers of the accused. Well, this little court, they didn't have 12 peers. The judge had picked six jurors, as he was allowed because it was a territorial court. They were all farmers, Anglo-Protestants, who'd been in the Northwest for less than three years. So they had no idea what the causes of the things were. They were all hand-picked, no Catholics, no Irish allowed. So the jury came back and they'd heard the evidence, they'd seen what had happened, and they cried out, they said, we find him guilty, but we ask for mercy. The judge said, yes, there you are, no mercy is being noted. All right. So, Riel's tried, he's convicted, and now he gets to speak. Now he gets to tell his story. And, I mean, we're in a courtroom, the court's been Regina in the summer. Anybody been in Regina in the summer? It's mm. hot, dirty, dry, and dusty. And in that little courtroom, which was about half the size of this hall, he tried to speak in English because his trial was not in French. If he'd been in Manitoba, he could have had a jury of 12, half of whom would have been French speaking. But no, he's in Regina with a trial of six, and he has to speak in English. So it's difficult. He does speak English. But it's not his, his native tongue. The translations are terrible, so he's given up on that. So he speaks from his heart and tells of his struggles over the last 15 years. First in creating the province of Manitoba, Riel was the founding father. It was his work, his political work, that was so significant. He organized all the various communities, English-speaking and French-speaking, uh, Protestant, Catholic, except for this one band of notorious Canadians, the, the Canadians that you saw here, who tried to depose him. And when that didn't work, they sent in Garnet Wolseley and 1,400 troops, and they did it. But the thing was that at the trial, when Riel got his opportunity, he called out for justice. He called out for an inquiry into the career of Louis Riel. That inquiry has never been held. In 1985, on the centenary of the Saskatchewan Northwest Resistance, there was a, um, a mock trial put on in the CBC with um, Zowski. But uh, that's about as far as that goes. So there have been calls for now 131 years for an inquiry. And now there's movement. There is movement afoot. And that's what's the exciting part for all of us, is that we can see that we can exonerate Riel with the help of the Canadian people, with help from our international friends. You might have noticed the Spanish that was intermixed in the slideshow. I've uh, shown this show in Cuba a couple of times. They love Louis Riel in Cuba. I don't know why, but they certainly do. And um, so we're working now on, on an exoneration petition. And we were very fortunate that uh, within the first two days that we put it up, it's on lead now, we were able to get a uh, hundred and some signatures right off the bat. So that was pretty exciting. So we are now in the process of soliciting your help through social media. We want to see the petition for the exoneration of Louis Riel become a hot item in the social media fields. Now, we're all a little long on the tooth, except for young, this youngster here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we work at it, but um, we need support. We need help. Yes, sir. Do you have a Facebook account? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're getting there. We've got Facebook. We've got a website. We're uh, twittering our twitters off away. And, uh, anyway, it's happening. So that's what we're up to. 
Now, that's all. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was worried. Thank you. Thank you.